Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Luke. He is a stand-up comedian, and he's sharing his life on TikTok and the various things that he's interested. He is autistic, so he talks about that as well. And he's just kind of an all-around great guy, and we've been chatting for a little bit here, so I'm like, maybe we should start recording. (laughs) So Luke, why don't you go (laughs) ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, So yes, I am. I'm Luke Paulson. Uh, I've been doing stand-up comedy for five years, and mostly my stand-up, I speak about uh, being autistic, but alongside doing stand-up, I also do a lot of talks, sort of talk about neurodiversity in workplaces um, that want to have more autistic people work there and i've been doing tiktok um when it was sort of when the pandemic when i wasn't able to go and do stand-up gigs i started doing videos on tiktok in january of this year and started doing very well on there so yeah that's a little bit about me so can you talk a little bit about what it is like for you to be autistic of course everyone's got different experiences but what, what is your experience like um, so I, it's, it's, yeah, like it is different for everyone. But for me, I think my main thing is that I'm, I'm not a great at interacting with people. Um, my main thing is I like to, to stay indoors a lot, but I do go to my special interests of going to the cinema on my own as much as possible or just staying indoors and watching movies. That's the one thing that I focus on a lot is, um, is movies. Um, but I'm not great in sort of, big social situations as well i don't like going into busy crowds um but those are just sort of the the little things um about me it's sort of it wasn't until i was probably about 25 that i was more accepting of myself like for a long time i'd been put down by people for being autistic and not treated that great and then when i got to 25 and started doing stand-up comedy and talking about that on stage that was a point where i was sort of felt a lot happier about myself yeah, that makes sense. So what was it like growing up with people not being very accepting of you? Um, yeah, it wasn't when I, it's, it was right from, from my primary school up to secondary school, high, high school, like right from there through the whole time I was always bullied for things, but I would have sort of um, someone that would help me in class and things, but I would still get bullied for that for someone coming and sitting next to me to help me with my work. Um, but then when I went to, to college and university, sort of things started to change and get get better there. And I sort of it was when I finally decided to open up a bit. But when I was at university, I did for a long time not tell people about me being autistic. And it wasn't until I finished university and people found out when they saw me doing stand up, they were just like, Oh, we just thought you were really shy this whole time, because I would not really talk to many people in university. Um so that's why I think it's because of what happened to me in school that I never really wanted to tell people. It wasn't until I got to a certain age where I was like, I'm just going to finally just be who I want to be now. Right. And with stand-up comedy and talking about your autism, what exactly is that like? Like, what are your shows like? Um, So I, I sort of want to make... So what I've tried to do is t- to get over how I was treated. I do make jokes about it now on stage because it does help a lot. Um. But it's also sort of trying to to make jokes about how I am in life and but also sort of educate people. At the same time, I want to make people laugh, but I also want to educate them at the same time. So a lot of my set is speaking about sort of things like eye contact or how I've been in the workplace. Um, sometimes I, I do take things too literally and it's sort of I make jokes about how I've been in jobs and I've been asked one question about something and if it's something that I'm really interested in, I will just throw too many facts at someone until they're like sort of a bit confused of what I'm doing. So yeah, my stand-up is, like I said, educating, but also making people laugh. Right. Do you ever have people like get mad at you or offended that you're poking fun at autism? Um, so I've had some, I've never really had any like hecklers or anything. Um, I had this one time where I used to make a joke because there's a lot of like, there's still sort of anti-vax stuff that people believe that vaccines cause autism. And I used to do a joke on stage to say that, yes, they do. But then it was me twisting it around saying that 
before I got a vaccine, like I was incredible at making eye contact. I could have full blown conversations with strangers and I wasn't really interested in anything. And then I make a joke saying, but then when I got the vaccine, couldn't make eye contact anymore, couldn't talk to strangers, um, but I was now very interested in film. Like, so that, but there was someone that got annoyed and thought that I was being serious on stage when I said that. But I've had a lot of, um, what's been the really nice thing is I've done a lot of gigs where I've had parents come up to me afterwards and be like, I have an autistic kid and it's really great to see you on stage. And I've had gigs before where the parents have either been with their kid and come and spoke to me and been like, oh, it's so nice to see you be able to do that. It's given my son like a lot of wanting to try and do this now as well. So yeah, it's, it's, I haven't really had anyone um, really offended. I think the thing that I've had the most is sometimes people don't know if to laugh, which is the worry thing. Like I'm on stage telling jokes about this because I want people to laugh. But I think they're worrying, being like, oh, he's talking about autism. Are we allowed to laugh? It's like, yes, I want you to. That's the reason I'm doing this. Right. Like you're talking from personal experience. You're not yeah. targeting somebody. So how did you get into stand-up comedy? Um, So for a long time I was doing YouTube. So I was doing a lot of like um, writing sketches on YouTube and doing sort of videos talking about types of things. And then when I was um, moved to London... Um, after living in London for a few years, I started going um, when I was, where my girlfriend lives. There was a, a comedy night at the end of the road. So we would go and watch it every single week. And then one day I went and spoke to the guy that ran it. And he was like, oh, you should come along and do a set if this is something you want to do. So I went along, did a set. They said, oh, you've got five minutes. I went on stage. I did two minutes of material because I got too anxious. And all I'd written was stuff about the Muppets. And then um, after that, yeah, just sort of went from there trying to do a gig every single week at that point. Um, so, yeah, that's how, how I started with it from there. And do you find yourself getting anxious in front of a crowd since you don't like talking in and being around <laughs> a bunch of people? So I do get, I still get very, very anxious before I go on stage. So I've done over 300 gigs now, but I still, I still get very scared before I go on stage. But as soon as I get on stage... I do feel better as soon as I'm telling jokes, but I still, after all that time, I don't look at the audience. Um, I still just look at the floor and I try and look up every now and again, but it's still very hard for me because I feel like I'm just going to focus on one audience member and that will just take me off my whole set and I won't be able to do anything. So I still look at the floor when I'm on stage. Right. Now you talked about your special interest uh, being movies or going to the cinema can you talk a little bit about what a special interest is and how that kind of exists and develops? Yeah, the special interest is something that's very sort of big in, in autism. Everyone, so like, even though everyone is different, is autistic, we do have the one thing of having a special interest. And for me, I've always been very like fixated on movies. I, I collect a lot of movies my whole time at university when you would get your student loan. Um, everyone else was spending it going on nights out it, for me it was just going to a shop and buying as many movies <laughs> as possible um so that's always been something from quite a young age because my dad and I we would rent out movies and I just loved going to the video rental store and being able to just pick a movie out and go home and watch it and then from that day I've just always been trying to watch as many movies as possible and do you watch all kinds of movies or do you stick to certain genres um, it's it's a mix for me. My my favorite genre is horror, but um, like horror and animation are my two favorite go to. And what is it like, you know, during the pandemic? I'm not really sure what all of your restrictions were, but I'm guessing at least for some time you weren't able to go to a theater. Yes, yeah, so they um they close just after. I think it was about 2019 they closed and they didn't open up again um until sort of J june time but at that point it still wasn't many films being released so it was just christopher nolan's tenet got released and that was the only thing that was showing the most in cinemas for weeks and the only other thing was they would just show a load of old movies um for a long time but before before they did close the cinemas it was at a point where um not many people were going to them so they shut them in march 2020 it was really weird i went to a cinema the day before they shut them and i think at this point i realized sort of 
it wasn't when everyone was sort of as worried. So I remember going to the cinema, but I think people knew what was going on. So there was probably about two other people. It was the film had been released on this day, but there was still only two other people in the whole cinema. And then the next day, you got all the emails. Oh, sorry, we're going to be closed until I think they closed until December because then I remember going and seeing Jurassic Park in December, and then a week later they were like, "Oh no, sorry, we're uh, we're closing the cinemas again." And yeah, they didn't open up again until sort of mid of um, 2021. So it was very weird for me. My girlfriend did get me a projector for um, for Valentine's Day. So because she knew I missed the cinema so much. So I was able to have that at home and be able to watch films at home. So it was still sort of having the cinema, which was really, really nice. Yeah, that's really sweet. So do you go to like the big openings when there's a ton of people? Or do you try to pick times where the theater will be less crowded so i've tried um i used to go to a lot of midnight screenings but i would always do it when a film had been out probably for a week or something because i found out with midnight screenings people if you do it on a friday most people don't want to be going to a midnight screening on a friday they want to be going out and doing things so there'd be a lot of times i would go to midnight screenings and i would be the only person in the screen or I would I would also take a day off work and go to like a 10 a.m. screening because everyone else is at work, so I'm just able to be in that cinema on my own. And when I did go and I took a day off work and because I really like Jurassic Park and they were showing it at the cinema nearby me, and I thought, oh, it's there's of course people are going to want to go and see Jurassic Park in the cinema. And I remember being sat in there and it was just me just in the cinema. I was like, this is perfect. This is how I I always wanted to be, just me on my own in the cinema. Right. Now, are there any upcoming films that you are very much looking forward to? Um, probably the new, the new Spider Man, uh, No Way Home, is what I'm most um, excited for at the moment. Just to see if they're gonna, they've been rumoring of bringing back all the old Spider Men. So I don't know if they're gonna do it. They brought back a load of villains, but it's just all these rumors around the movie. So I'm hoping it's gonna be as good as I'm excited for. Of course, yes. Now, you talked a little bit. You said you started TikTok uh, during the pandemic when going to do stand-up comedy wasn't quite as available. And you've talked about movies, of course, on TikTok. So what has TikTok been like for you? Um, It was, it was really weird because at first I'd been putting up just some videos of my cat and stuff but I've re- so it was just videos of him we'd bought catnip and he liked that and stuff and it was just videos i'd film of him in the house and then one day i was like oh i've got sketches written um and i can't do stand up right now this stuff written here that i want to be able to do on stage but i can't what if i make it into a sketch and that was on january 5th um that i just i made a sketch put it up and then for some reason i woke up the next morning and it had over 2000 likes and i was like all right what's well, what's going on here and then I gained loads of followers and then I sort of set a routine for myself that was okay if this has done well I'm gonna make a video every single day now and it seems that if I talk about autism or make a sketch about that people do want to see stuff like that so I decided from January yeah from back in January to start making something every single day and I've I've stuck to that as as best as I can and yeah it's been going really well and I feel like you mentioned that you might have a job do you have a full-time job yeah, so I um I do audio visual um for a law firm, but so before lockdown it was doing like live events, just micing up people and um working on the sound desk in in the office. And then when um the pandemic came about and we were working from home, it's all just gone to Zoom. So now I just have to be sat at a desk and go tell someone they're on mute, which is which is very different from doing a live event in an office. And so then how do you manage TikTok and work and, you know, watching movies and all of the day to day? So I work from from nine uh, nine thirty until five thirty. So I either make some sketches over the weekend and sort of have them saved as drafts and put them up or I will film something on my lunchtime and um, put that up or or film it at lunchtime and then put it up in the in the evening at like 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Uh, and all my work know that I do TikTok. So they're, they're, there's people from my work that follow me 
and have seen my stuff so they all know that i do it so it's, it's all good there well that's always good you kind of always gotta walk that fine line of if you've mentioned work or just do something quote unquote controversial or something that everything's good yeah so yeah there's nothing bad my work have all seen everything that i do and like they they enjoy it and can you talk a little bit about not necessarily like specifically what you do at your job, but what it's like being neurodivergent and working uh, in kind of an office. <laughs> um. So, yeah, so I, for five years, I did um freelancing where I was working in a lot of uh, law firms and I also got to work at the Natural History Museum. So I got to do a lot of different work, but doing that um, when you're freelancing and it's not like you're permanent there um it was always hard to sort of tell people oh i'm autistic because it was sort of not every place really understands and i had some bad experiences and then when i freelance i went and did two permanent jobs but it was at places that didn't really care about me being autistic um at one place when telling them uh, they made me go for an iq test which I don't think it's legal um, now when I think about it, um, which is very weird. But then in my current job, as soon as I told them, they were like, oh, we, we've we've done our research. Like, they, they let me go to the interview early, let me actually look around the building before I have my interview. And then when I started there, they were like, oh, what, can, what changes can we do for you? Because there was some places I work at before where they would do changes for me, like giving me noise cancelling headphones at my desk or taking a light out from above my desk because I really don't like the office lights because they are very, very bright and not nice to look at. So I had that in one place where they did take it out for me. But then I had a manager who would sh- who bought a desk lamp and would shine it in my direction. So yeah, the two jobs before this were that I had were very horrible. But in the current one that I'm in, um, they've just treated me well straight away, which, which shouldn't be a surprise. I shouldn't be able to say, oh, a workplace has treated me well. But yeah, straight away they said, oh, we've done our research. Uh, we're happy to do any arrangements for you. And they've done all of that. And just, it, yeah, so I have had some hard times working in a few places, but in my current place, they've just been good right from the start. And is the best thing for an employer to do, like beyond doing some research themselves, purely just to ask, like, what is the best way to accommodate you in the office? Yeah, so that's what my manager's done. Even when, even when I was... um working from home they were like oh what can we send anything to your house so because i got like a monitor sent to me for work and we have our laptops at home and that they were like is there anything else we can send to help um and in the office they were because i always turn off the i have the, the light switch behind me at my desk so i i'm the one that turns off the light and the rest of the team are happy are fine with it they're just like oh can can you switch it back on if we ask or anything and my manager's always asking because in those two previous jobs that I was in where I wasn't treated very well, I was the one that had to send them documents to tell them what autism was, um, and they never bothered reading them. But then when I got to my new job, um, my manager was like, yeah, I already did my research before you started here, um, and even before you had the interview, I was like, oh, this is a first. I don't, I'm surprised this has actually happened, that someone's actually bothered to look into things before I properly start. So that was um, that was nice that they're always asking like even though I've been there for two years now, they still ask after two years, what more can we like do for you? Is there anything that we can help with? Yeah, that's truly great and should not be surprising that it's great. It just should. No. <laughs> just should. <laughs> so since your like current employer is doing a great job with everything and they did their research, at what point do you typically disclose that you are autistic when looking for a new job? So I for a long time um i never used to disclose it at the beginning because of the sort of bad experiences i had i was like oh i'm worried they're not gonna want to take me on because i said say this and then when it got to this job i was like seeing as i've already been treated badly at the last two because i told them about two months into my job about it just to be like oh i need these changes done i was like i'm just gonna tell them straight away and then for them to turn around and straight away be like hey you can come to the office and look around early. I was like, okay, that's something that I need to do from now on. If I ever start another job, I need to tell them right from the beginning because it, it just made, made the work a lot easier. And in those previous places, telling them later on the job made it sort of harder because I would be more worried when I first started there of how I was going to act because people 
didn't know. Mm -hmm. And do you find, like, if they hadn't been accommodating, like, from the beginning, and, like, would you just kind of said, like, well, then I'm just not going to interview, like, because I am looking for somewhere that will accommodate me? Yes, that's the thing that it's always been, because when I've had interviews, I, it, I always feel just better when someone somewhere does want to accommodate straight away. If I had have said that and then they just didn't want to do anything because what I normally ask for for an interview, I always say, oh, is there any way you can send me over the questions beforehand? Um, but with the interview for this one, they were like, oh, it's it will be an interview, but because of you telling us this, we want to make it that the interview is more of a chat. So when I did get there, it was like they did still ask questions, but they made it a lot more relaxed. It, and because sometimes I go to jobs and they're like, hey, tell me about all these previous times or tell me your whole work history, which is always a bit like worrying for me. I always panic in that situation because I feel like I can't say it. But with this, they were just asking some little things. Hey, what did you enjoy in your previous jobs? And I just I find it a lot nicer when an interview isn't just too serious that you can actually feel like you're just having a conversation, but you still know that you are being interviewed for a job. And did your employer, like, have any way that you knew that they would respond positively to you? Or were you just kind of taking a shot in the dark? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, because I, I didn't really know. The, but they were just friendly straight away. Because um, I was just talking about... Because when I worked at the National History Museum, they were like, oh, tell us about... Because we've you said that. Tell us about the fun things you did there. Because that was, like, one of my favorite places to work. So I got to speak about doing the things at the museum, sort of the things I got to learn about of when scientists would come in and speak about certain things. So it was fun to be able to speak about my interest there of what I enjoyed with that job instead of having to give this whole old work history that didn't really have anything to do with the job. Yeah, that's completely understandable. So what is it that you're like professionally trained in per se? Um, so yeah, I... <laughs> It's a bit of a mix. Um, so I now do, with my current job, I do video editing as well. So it's a lot of, um, I have to edit the Zoom events afterwards, but I also work on a lot of graphics, so some in After Effects, and it's just like little fun graphics, so either a title flying in or something for our website. And then um, with lockdown, we started doing podcasts. So I now edit podcasts as well. And so the main thing that I've been sort of, doing over my whole time of um, doing audiovisual work is yeah, video editing, recording podcasts. And then I used to do, like filming people as well because we have cameras in the office. So we film. So it's a, it's a very mixed job, um, but it's one that I really enjoy doing. So what are your hopes for the future? Since you're still quite young, got plenty, plenty of life left to live. <laughs> um, I think it's just, going further with stand-up comedy, um, seeing what else I can do with TikTok because I've had a lot of good opportunities from that now, um, and then just seeing where my job will take me next as well. Would the goal, do you think, to eventually become full-time with stand-up comedy? Yeah, that, that would be great because it, it's been really nice to be able to do as many gigs as I get to now and get to do all different Exactly. Like I do a lot that are in London, but it's really nice to be able to do ones out of London or travel for a bit for them and just do ones to very big audiences. So it's, yeah, that's the thing that I really want to focus on the most now. And where have you gone uh, with stand-up comedy? Like, what places have you been able to visit? Um, so it's only in the it's only in the U places in the UK, but it's been it's just like um. I've done some really. I did a really nice gig in um Cambridge, which is only a little bit out of London, but I've done nice gigs in in uh brighton as well in the uk um and yeah in reading as well so it's all different places around the uk that i travel to even if it is somewhere that's like an hour out of london it's still really nice because i found that gigs out of london it's sort of in even if i do it in a little town it'll be people that want to travel to come and watch uh, comedy and then i've been able to do um i did a fringe festival um not not too long ago it was in a place called colchester uh, it was their first um, Fringe Festival, and I did three nights at that festival. Um, and that was really nice because 
I had just been doing online advertising and I was thought, oh, maybe not too many people are going to turn up, but I had a really good audience for all three nights. And I sort of got to that point where when it was the third night, I was sort of thinking to myself, I wish I was doing more nights now because I just had so much fun being able to do night after night when I hadn't just for a whole hour long show. Mm -hmm. And and what is this Fringe Festival? Um, So... There's quite a few that happen, like Edinburgh Fringe is one of the big... So it's where just um, either comedians or theatre groups um, take their shows. So it will be... A Fringe Festival is something that normally happens over... Like, sometimes it can be just a weekend. Um, Edinburgh Fringe is something that happens for a whole month. But this Colchester Fringe was something that happened for... um, Just for four days. So it happened from... It was from the Thursday until the sunday so i did thursday friday and saturday um yeah so it's just where people come and pay to see shows that are done so they do it over multiple venues in a town that's really nice cool i am as you're like mentioning all these different places in the uk i'm like i know those names i've got this i've got this (laughs) <laughs> but I'm like I like whenever people talk about festivals I'm like I don't I don't do festivals I never know like what different festivals are out there yeah <laughs> so is there somewhere that you would love to go to do stand-up comedy um it probably is just trying to America like I don't know where in America but there's a lot so there's people that have um when I've been on TikTok, been like, oh, have you ever done a gig here? Um, will you ever do a gig here? And I was like, I want to go and visit these places. I don't know when it would happen, but it would be nice because I have, because a lot of my audience on TikTok is people from America that enjoy my stand up. So it would be really nice one day to be able to go there and do some shows. Have you had the chance to visit America at all? Yeah. So the last time I was in America was um, New York in 2014. That was the last time in October 2014 was the last time I went to, to America. So I've been to New York and then when I was younger, went to went to Orlando and went to all the uh, all the Disney parks. Uh, I think there's six in Orlando. I think that's right. Um, there's... I'm trying to think. I think there's Epcot, mm-hmm. um, Animal Kingdom, mm-hmm. then the normal Disney World. And then I can't think what the other two are. So the normal... So the other three are. The normal Disney World is called Magic Kingdom. Magic Kingdom. And then the other one you missed, uh, when you were here, it probably was called MGM Studios. And now it is... Oh, God. But there are only four. Um, So, yeah. Is there only four? There are only four. Maybe I went to... Okay, I think think what I did, maybe, is... I'm saying six because I think we did we did Universal Studios as well. Yes. And then next door to Universal Studios, I don't know if they changed the name now, but it used to be Island of Adventure. Yes. And there's yeah, there's two are like together in as like the Universal Park. Yeah, so they're just mm-hmm. yeah, next door to yes. each other. And the fourth one of Disney World is called Hollywood Studios. So like make it confusing. Because ah, okay. Oh yeah, because there's the the Tower of Terror used to the Hollywood Tower of Terror used to be yes. there, but it was still like a Disney park. Exactly. And then there is like, I think there's like two water parks and then there's also. Oh yeah, that would have been it. I went to, I remember going to one of the water parks. Mm-hmm. And then there is like the downtown shopping area and then unrelated to Disney World, I guess, the SeaWorld, which I think still exists. Um, so you got lots of stuff to do in Orlando and I could talk about yeah. Orlando <laughs> for hours. Uh <laughs> I really want to go to, um, I think it's in Pennsylvania. Um, I want to go to the Sesame Street. I think it's called, uh, I can't remember what the park's called, but I know it's a, there's a Sesame Street theme park. Sesame, Ses- Sesame Place is what it's called. Well, I'm going to quick Google this here. Um, <laughs> because if it is in Pennsylvania, it is. Wow. It is in Philadelphia, which makes sense. I never get down to Philadelphia. Um but I live in Pennsylvania, so I feel like I should have known that. Um, but I was not raised here, so that'll be my excuse for not knowing that we had a Sesame <laughs> Street place in the state I live in. Yeah, I think I think it's part theme park, and I think they've made like a little water park oh. as well there. Very cool. And what is it like for theme parks for you? I've, I've gotten onto the side of TikTok that talks about 
um, accommodating many types of people at theme parks and theme parks, you know, they're busy and crazy. And <laughs> So I went to, um, I went to Disneyland Paris, um, cause the last time I'd been was in 2019. And then I went a couple of weeks ago because they've, um, some of the regulations. So I just have to get the Eurostar, which is the train all the way there, so, which takes quite a while, but, um, it's nice there and you still have to you have to wear a mask around the whole park but the good thing is that i get um the accessibility card which is a little green card that you have to just um, you have to bring a documentation along to show what your disability is and then you just tick your disability on the thing and then they have the disabled queue for the rides so these are just the quicker queues that you you go to because some of the rides are like 140 minutes to queue to get on which i i cannot do um, so with these ones, you just go there with your green card and you get on the ride within, sometimes it might take 10 minutes, but sometimes it only takes five minutes to get on a ride, which is a lot nicer for me. Um, cause I don't really like queuing for a long time because it's very, very busy and just not great. And, um, yeah, not great with crowds, but luckily with going to Disney at the moment, they've made it where it's a lot smaller crowds, that there's a lot more space, um, a lot of social distancing. So it's a, it's a lot nicer, but um when i did go to theme parks as a kid i don't think my parents ever really knew there was a with a card like this so i th- i think as a kid there was just me queuing up for ages and getting a bit stressed out in queues but now it's good to know that they've got these things at theme parks so they've i only realized recently that they've done it with uk theme parks and i'd been going to them for a long time and never realized in this whole time i would have been able to get onto the rides um a lot easier yeah and to hear that like with disneyland paris like you're like here is my proof as to why I need this. And it's not just kind of like anyone can walk up and claim something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Cause um, I think there was a weird thing that happened in America at one point where people were getting that card, but selling it to people or having that disabled person come along with them for the day, mm. paying them to come to the park with them. So there was those sort of things, but I think this is in Paris is a lot stricter with those things. I don't think they would allow that type of thing to happen. I, I do recall hearing something about, it was specifically like, bring a wheelchair user with you. And it's like, what? Ah, that's not, <laughs> that's not <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> no. And so what is it like, you know, if you do get in these situations where you do get overly anxious or it's just too much for you, what sort of coping mechanisms do you have to kind of, recenter and stabilize um so it's a lot of sort of trying to walk away from the situation i'm trying to calm down um i do have my stimming where i move my hands in certain ways to try and sort of it helps me with stuff um and i do keep things in my pocket like little sensory toys to play with and stuff um and it's also a lot of breathing because i did I did some therapy for some time and the person that I had therapy with was um, had specialized with working with um, autistic people. So they gave me a lot of things to do in um, stressful situations. So there's a lot of breathing and just, yeah, having my things to, to squeeze or whatever to help. And what is it like, you know, friends and family meeting someone new? Have you found that people are understanding around you and, that they're able to accommodate and not be complete jerks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I've had with some sort of, um, like when I said, I was, I was college and stuff, there were some people that were a bit confused by me at first of how I would act in class or whatever. Um, but I think over the years, because of doing stand up comedy, like my confidence has got a lot better. So I've sort of, have been better with meeting people but i think sometimes people might think if the way that i reply or i'm having a conversation with them and i'm not looking at them they might think that i'm being rude or that when i'm having the conversation with them i start looking around the room instead of actually looking at them so they think i'm not listening to the conversation even though i am still listening to the conversation um yeah i haven't really there's been times where people sort of been like oh they think i'm weird or something because i'm not acting how they would want me to but People always seem to be very, very accommodating when they find out um, that I'm autistic. So since 
stand-up comedy has boosted your confidence and you mentioned that, you know, parents will come up to you and, you know, talk about their child or, you know, a child will be there and say, you know, good things about seeing you doing this. What sort of advice would you give to either parents of children with autism or autistic children to survive and thrive in the world we've got? Um... Always, I feel like I can never <laughs> try. I try and give my best advice. I think it's just like just try and be as accommodating to your child's needs as possible. Don't think that the way they act is just that they're trying to get at you or it's bad. I think like my parents before they knew that I was autistic, I think they thought that I was just a kid that was getting too angry about things or that I was just like a a bad child because I was either just angry at stuff a lot so i think it's just sort of just trying to understand your child as best don't be annoyed if they're sort of having a meltdown over something or getting angry about stuff just be there to help and speak to them in a way that will make them feel better about the situation because i think if you shout at an autistic child when they're having this meltdown then it will make the situation even worse so it's just being for them them there for as best as possible when they when those situations are hard and when they have these, uh, like, I think my parents, were, um, when I was a kid with my special interests as well, I was always really into animals. And my mum, I think I would tell her so many animal facts. There was probably a point where I was just telling her too many. So always just show a love for your, for your kids' special interests as well. And so then when did you find out that you have autism? Um, so... Um, I'd already, so like, I wasn't um, really speaking that much when I was a kid. It wasn't until I was about three years old that I was speaking properly. And I think at that point, my, my parents sort of w weren't quite sure what was going on. And then it wasn't until I was in school that um, one teachers at school sort of saw the way that I was acting in class, that I wasn't always paying attention or I was fiddling with something. Um, and then said to my parents, at the age of seven, do you think Luke is, is autistic? And then at that point, I then went and got a diagnosis to um to find out. So yeah, at the age of seven, I was diagnosed. Okay, so like it hasn't, it wasn't like so much later in life or where there were all these questions, but you were just bombarding your parents with uh, animal yeah. facts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's because there is now like a lot of my friends who are in their twenties and thirties are getting diagnosed so late in life, um, and I think for me. Um, it was a lot better to be like diagnosed younger because I have friends now that for so long when they've been diagnosed, they're like, oh, now my whole childhood and my teenage years make so much sense. And like for me, having that diagnosis at, at a young age made me understand myself and be like, oh, people are going to treat me badly, but I just need to understand it's not like something that I can help. It's just the way that I am. Right. And so... Did your special interest like change from animals to movies? So I am still I am still really into animals. The one, the one thing that I found during lockdown, which was great, is that I found a website called Explore.org, and on that website is just an, loads of animal cameras. Um, so I really got into uh, California condors um, during lockdown because there would be um, a camera in a tree. And it was a, a nest and they had this little baby called a uh, Inaco who is, cause these birds get massive. I think their, their wingspan, the longest recorded is 9.5 like feet, the, how long their wings are. Um, so I just, I just really got interested in that. So I'm still very interested in animals. So I saw the mix of animals and, uh, and movies for me still. And because I asked about the movies, do you have a favorite animal? Um, favorite, yeah. Favorite animal, like I said, at the moment is <laughs> is the california condor but um i also really love owls so like my favorite owl is a is a barn owl but i'm also my favorite animals were just changing at one point it was sloths um but i really i really love um orangutans as well and then bats so i've got like quite a lot of um different animals right and i believe you mentioned that you have a cat yes i do have a have a, a bombay cat he's a little little black cat who um, is asleep next door right now. He sleeps mostly all the day and then cries at us when he wants food. Yes. 
<laughs> the life of a cat. <laughs> oh, gosh. Now, uh, it has not come up, so I'm just going to ask the question. Um, your Instagram handle, and I believe also your TikTok handle, is Vegan Luke. Yeah. So, why is it Vegan Luke? Uh, so, I have been... I have been vegan for um for 15 years now but that's the thing with my accounts like um on Instagram sometimes I'll post food but most of my accounts are not about veganism uh, on TikTok I think I've probably got about two videos about veganism um but I still always have <laughs> the weird thing I found with TikTok I still have people that try and get get at me by sending me videos of like someone chopping up meat or something and I'm like but my account, I've never posted anything like this. Why do you think I'm going to get annoyed at you sending this to me? If you looked at my account, you would just see that I'm just doing comedy videos. So, yeah, it has been 15 years, but I never really talk about it online. It's just the username that I've had for a very long time because with my YouTube as well, um, I've had YouTube since um, 2008. So my that was my username on there. So I decided to just carry it over onto every single app that i'm on even if i don't post about that sort of stuff that much that's great you gotta stick to the stick to the username from 2008 (laughs) yes now is it easy to be a vegan in london yeah it definitely is um at first um it wasn't when i first went vegan so i went vegan when i was 15 so at first it wasn't but it's been yeah got a lot easier um over the years there's pretty much in london now there's always a vegan place opening all the time or either a restaurant has a lot of vegan options so it's pretty much the easiest time now but when i first started it was just a lot of really random shops just selling stuff that wasn't that great um (laughs) and my dad trying to experiment with making me food like buying just random things he tried to i remember one time he tried to make me do do you know what toad toad in the hole is no so it's like do do you know yorkshire puds what yorkshire puddings yes so it's like that but my dad got this stuff egg replacer stuff but it's where you just put sausages on top so it's in the sort of the same type of um i don't know if it'd be pastry or whatever it is but it's the same sort of stuff that you would have for a yorkshire pud and i remember my dad trying to make that when i first went vegan and all it was was just the sausages. The whole thing just went flat, and it was just sausages on top of this pretty much flat Yorkshire pud. So that's how it was when I first went went vegan. When my dad would try and try and make me a lot of stuff because he was very confused by it as well. Well, of course, and and especially you know, fifteen years ago. Um, whereas, as you said now, like veganism is more common and you're in a very populous place so i'm glad to hear it the food's better and the options are better yeah and that was the thing i liked about when i went to um when i went to new york it was very very easy there because there was so many places so at the end of every episode i do ask all of my guests a random question that doesn't have to do with anything we've talked about and we've covered a lot so um, not necessarily sure where this random question is going to come from. <laughs> um, hmm. I was like, we've talked about a lot of your favorites, so maybe I should do some sort of like hypothetical question that makes you think. I could go with the standard. The standard question, that's like the random question that everyone asks. If you were on a deserted island, what is the one thing that you would need to have? Um... Oh, it's gonna no, I can't really do two things, can I? It would have to be either headphones and and the music for the headphones, because I would need to block out all the all the loud noises that would be happening on that island. All right, that brings this episode to a close. Of course, I will be leaving links for Luke in the description. So he has a link tree, which brings you to social medias, different podcasts he's been on, all sorts of good information. So that will be there. And of course, his username is Vegan Luke on a lot of different places. So feel free to go connect with him. 
And if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description and that brings you to all of our social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, along with all of the past episodes and all of the past resources and connections from prior guests. And if you would like to be a guest yourself, I would love to have you. You can just send me an email and we can connect. Or if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, donations are always accepted and that information is in the description as well. So thank you so much, Luke, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time, bye. Thank you very much for having me. Goodbye. (laughs) 